Welcome to a first look at the latest Valeria game, Castellans of Valeria. Now, this is an unpaid preview. The copy of the game provided to us by Daily Magic Games was a prototype that we will be passing on to another reviewer. So, please be aware that what we are talking about is a nearly complete game that wasn't quite finished when we got it. Anything said here could change with the production copy, but we don't expect the actual rules to change at all. Now, Castellans of Valeria is being designed by Isaias Vallejo and features artwork from, of course, it's a Valeria game. It's the Miko. It will be launching on Kickstarter on June the 13th, 2023. Once funded, and I don't think that'll be a problem, it will be published by Daily Magic Games and will be available in retail. I do not have an MSRP of it. This is an area majority style board game that plays one to five players with games taking an hour or two, depending on the player count and thinking time of the players. We would call this a medium weight game that takes a bit to learn, but flows very well once you start playing. Mm -hmm. So in Castellans of Valeria, players compete to become the Castellan of the newly founded city of Kosk. You're going to be drafting dice, managing four resources, and taking actions to add manors, temples, citizens, ships, lighthouses, and more to the six different districts of the city. Along with this, players will be buying and selling goods, trying to gain influence in the four guilds of Valeria. At the end of each round, magistrates will wander different districts and rank everyone's performance. After five rounds, the player with the most points wins and is declared the new Castellan of Cost. And normally this is where I would point you to an unboxing video showing off what you get in the box for Castellans of Valeria. But since the copy we played was a prototype, we didn't record one. As it stands now, all of the pictures you may have seen from us show components that will be changed in the final game. Yeah, we know for a fact that in our prototype copy, the wooden components came out smaller than planned. Uh, they actually fit very loosely on the awesome dual layer player boards. I hope those don't change because they're nice and are a little bit small and hard to manipulate. So we do know those are going to get bigger. The other big change I know is coming is when this game showed up, there were three different books that did separate things. There was a separate book for um, solo play. There was a book just on background on the city and the different guilds. And there was the rule book. But the problem was the background book for the guilds also had some of the rules for how some of the cards worked. And in the end, I think the publisher has decided just to make it combined into one big book. Uh, plus, actually, the copy we had had blank spaces that said 200 words. So we do know that is going to change. Now that said, we do know that this game will come with fantastic dual layer player boards and a ton of wooden components. Mm -hmm. All of these bits of wood will be silk screened and really do look great as they start to fill the board. As an added bonus, all of the shapes are unique, which helps make the game more accessible. Honestly, except for the incomplete rulebook and guidebook, this could easily be mistaken for a completed game. I am really looking forward to seeing what the production copy looks like, which should be even more impressive than what we saw. Well, let's move on to an overview of play. Note, this is a fairly complex game with lots of moving parts, so please don't take this as a full teach. Mm -hmm. Doing so would take way longer than we want to spend during a review segment. All right, start with each player grabbing a player board and all the wooden bits in their color. Fill the spots on the board with those pieces. Again, two-player board. You're just placing, doing a shape puzzle here because it's pretty obvious what goes where. Uh, one thing to be aware of, though, is watch your starting resources because the starting levels are indicated by a faint white dot. We did miss that the first time we were playing until partway through going, oh, we should have started with stuff. Now, players place their scoring market on the score track and an influence token at the bottom of each of the four guild tracks. Each player in reverse turn order picks any manor to build and places it into an empty district and gets the influence reward for that built manor as well as unlocking whichever ability you've chosen. The board is set up by laying out two sets of citizen cards, creating the wharf deck and adding green, the neutral player, towers into any empty districts after the players have placed their manors. Mm -hmm. The round tracker is then placed on the first spot, and the game is ready to start. So the game is played over five rounds, each of which represents one month in game time. At the end of months one through four, three districts out of the six will score. In the final round of the game, round five, all six are going to score. Each round, players will first draft dice, then spend those dice to take actions. Start of each round, number of dice are rolled equal to the player count, plus one times three which sounds a little confusing. There's brackets over player count plus one. You roll a bunch of dice so that there's three for every player and three left over. 
Then in turn order, players are going to each draft one die. When a player drafts a die, they get what is shown on that die, be it influence, gold, or resources like wood, stone, food, and magic. When you gain influence this way, you choose one of the four guild tracts of Holy, Shadow, Soldier, or Worker, and move your influence marker up one spot. You then collect any bonus earn for how far up the track you are. And I kind of wonder what names other groups give those four symbols that have been around since Card Kingdoms of Valeria. I know we always call the shadows thieves and we always call the um, holy religious or clerics. So I think each group probably has their own name for those. Now, once all players have drafted three dice, they then begin taking actions. They spend one die at a time. Each action has a specific die face associated with it. And when using the matching die, you get a bonus. No, you can still use any die to take any action. You just get the bonus if you use the right one. Most of these actions have you placing things out into a single district on the board, with the cost being some of a resource plus an amount of gold equal to the number of the same piece, no, same other types of that piece already existing in that district. Now, some actions will include sub actions that you can also do after completing the main action. Similar to pretty much all other Valeria games, magic is a wild card resource that can be added to any other resource in order to pay a cost. The trick, as always, is that you have to pay some of the original resource to start with. You can't pay for something with only magic. Now, the various actions, we're going to cover each of them fairly quickly. I'm just going to go across the player board, top to bottom, left to right. Um, first is ship. Buy and sell goods based on the currently face-up wharf card. You're going to have to spend crates to do this. You start with two crates, you can unlock a third during play. After buying and selling, you then have the option to build a ship. These cost a couple wood, and you got to pay gold for any ships that are already there. Finally, you can pay two gold to move a ship. This is the only building once built, I'm saying building, but it's a ship, that can be moved once it's in play. Now, if you used an influence die to do this, you also get the bonus of going up on one of the guild tracks of your choice. And ships, like many of the things in the game, count for one point once we're scoring districts. Now, you use the harvest action to get the resources currently shown on your dice, whether the dice are used yet or not. You also get to go up on one, the guild track of one of your choice. If you use a magic die to harvest, you will also gain one additional resource of your choice. After harvesting, you have the option to build a windmill. Windmill costs two food plus uh, and, and uh, any potential gold uh, for windmills that have already been placed in the area you are going to look, place. Mm -hmm. Windmills are placed between districts and count as one half of a point for each of the adjacent district. Now, the manor action lets you place a manor out on your board. Now, this is the free action you got at the beginning of the game as well. Except for that free one, you're going to have to pay wood and potentially gold again, based on how many manors are already there. When building a manor, including the one at the start of the game, you get to pick which one off your player board to remove. Each one of these gives a player some kind of unlockability that you're going to get for the rest of the game. Now, most of these abilities boost existing actions, but there's a couple interesting ones, like one that unlocks your third shipping crate that I talked about for the first action, let your gold track go a little longer, and there's a special manor called the Lighthouse that's going to give you points for any ships in the district it's placed on. Now, when you do place a manor on the board, you're going to get to go up in two of the guild tracks that are on the board. You're going to go up one in both tracks based on which district you're in. Now, if you do use a wood die to take this action, you get a free wood before paying for anything else. And manners, like most pieces, count as one in the district they're scoring. Now, the temple action lets you place a temple on the board. Temples cost two stone and potentially some gold. When a temple is placed, you go up on both the guild tracts in the district, uh, as listed on that district, by two. Now, when you use a stone die to take the temple action, you gain a bonus of one stone before paying any costs. Temples count as one point in each of the uh, each in their districts when scoring. Recruit is the final action available and lets you hire citizens. You pay a cost in food based on where the citizen card you want is located at the top of the board. You then gain one influence in the guild shown on the citizen. You then take a citizen token from your player board, place it in the district of your choice, and go up one more on a track, but this time the track is based on what district you put them in. Now, if you use a food die when taking recruit, you get a free food before paying costs. Now, citizen tokens count as one point for each district. In addition, each citizen breaks the rules, the citizen card. They do things like let you manipulate the dice when spending, manipulate the dice when drafting, 
give you additional resources when you take certain actions and so on. There's all kinds of these. And in addition to spending a die to take an action, players can also choose to build a monument. Mm -hmm. These cost gold and only gold. Players start with one of each of three types of monuments. Monuments give you an immediate guild influence boost, plus they give you points during scoring round based on what exists in the districts that they are built in. For example, the statue monument gives its owner one point per temple in that district, while the gate gives points based on the number of citizens in adjacent districts bridged by the gate. There can only be one of each monument type in each district mm -hmm. or area of placement area for the monuments. Now, one thing to watch for when taking these actions is a chain of effects. It's the powers you've unlocked by placing manners, so the powers on your boards, and the citizen cards you purchased. Powers from both of these can modify the rules and are honestly easy to forget when you're in the middle of taking your turn. Now, once players have taken three actions each, the round ends and scoring begins. The spot the round marker is on indicates which districts will score. You go through each district, one by one, awarding points based on majorities. Basically, players count one point per thing of their color in that district, and the player with the most points gets six points, the second gets four, and the player with third most gets two. Mm -hmm. Monuments don't count towards area majority, and windmills only provide half a point. But otherwise, you just add up how many things of each color and, the, and give out the points based on that. Next, you score the wharf by comparing how many cargo cubes from each player are there with points awarded for first, second, and third. After district storing, you're then going to give points for your lighthouses, which I mentioned were to pay for ship, and the monuments that have been placed on the board. Note, these score every round regardless of what district they're in. So they score every round of the game no matter what. Finish off the round by passing the first player marker clockwise, flipping over a new wharf card, adding a green neutral building to a random district, and refreshing the citizen tracks. Now, after the fifth round, there is one final thing you need to do. Score the four guild influence tracks. First place on each track gets six points, second gets four, and third gets two. After this, the player with the most points wins and is declared the new Castellan of Kosk. With that overview done, let's move on to our thoughts on this, the newest Valeria game. So there is a lot going on in this game, and there are a lot of components. There's a lot of stuff, and it can be very overwhelming at first. I really expected this to be a much heavier game than it was. This is especially true during the first learning game and during your initial teach, when even just teaching the game is a little difficult. Besides all the different components, all these different building types, I'm going to call them buildings, even though they're citizens and ships, each of these all over your player board, they're also filled with icons. And to be fair, those icons aren't really clear until you learn what it all means. Yeah, there are a lot of interacting parts here and things that trigger other things and act differently based on how you pay, which, yes. which just makes it more difficult. And usually, like, I find the iconography in Valeria games to be very clear. But this felt like a race for the galaxy level of confusion when I was first learning the game, especially reading that initial rule book that came in our prototype copy. Now, thankfully, the designer or was the publisher, I'm not sure which, did reach out and provide everyone who had a preview copy with some great reference sheets that I am very pleased to say will be in your copy of the game. However, you get it. You want these. I will admit I spent a lot of time looking back and forth between the reference sheets and the player board that first game, just reassuring mm -hmm. myself I wasn't forgetting things. Yeah. So I will say by game three, I had it all down, all I needed to do. And even while writing this review up and prep for the show, I just grabbed a player board to remember what the different actions are and what the costs were. Because once you do have it, I just like Race for the Galaxy, it's internalized and it actually works rather well. But it's going to take a bit to learn it. And what I will say is that once I did internalize it and we actually started playing and once we started stepping through every action, okay, place the building, then do the thing and go up on the track and do the thing. And then like some other player, like, oh, don't forget the sub action. You can build a windmill now, right? Once we got that down, I found the game actually played rather quick and flowed very well. And what looks like too many decision points didn't even lead to that much AP or analysis paralysis. By the end of the first game, after seeing the in-game value of the various actions and why you might want to take them, everyone at the table fully understood not only how everything worked mechanically, but also why it worked and how it worked strategically. 
And every game I have played this where I've taught the game, this led to people planting to play a second game now that they got it. In general, this is a good thing. But it also means that to really enjoy this game, you're probably going to need to play it at least twice. Once in a learning game, and then once you grok it, you can play to win. I would say this is pretty standard for the games of uh, this level or higher levels of complexity. You're going to absorb things that first game and getting to exploring different tactics in the second game. Now, once I had everything down, I found I really enjoyed this game. This is a medium weight game that requires a lot of strategy and planning ahead for your actions, while also rewarding tactical play and adjusting those plans based on what the other players are doing. Unlike other medium weight Euros, this didn't feel at all like multiplayer solitaire. I always find a lot of these games with their own private player boards and things kind of feel like you're doing your own thing. Every action you take is going to affect the other players in some way, whether that's drafting a die they needed, hiring a citizen they planned on getting, building in a district they were controlling, moving boats so that their lighthouses no longer score, and more. All of it matters. In fact, you're probably going to spend at least a small amount of time cursing fellow players, either because they've drafted what you need or taken an action which has priced you out mm -hmm. of the action you had planned. Now, a side effect of this interaction is that it keeps players engaged, even when it's not their turn. Between planning your own moves and watching what everyone else is doing, you find yourself constantly analyzing the board and looking for opportunities and trying to outsmart your opponents. This, of course, also means it's going to be limiting if you're looking for a game where you can chat at. Yeah. It's not in any way a casual game. You need to focus on the boards. Now, the downside of all of this is that Castles of Valeria, to me at least, is so far the driest of the Valeria games. This is a very mechanical, mathy game. There's not a lot here that says Valeria. And really, except for the fact that one of your resources is magic, I don't get a fantasy feel of this at all. I don't feel like I'm in a fantasy setting. This feels like a medieval city builder, not an epic race to finish the city before the hordes attack. Yeah, there's, there's no tension at all. Uh, if there's a horde coming, no one seems to have mentioned it to us. <laughs> now, that's not to say this doesn't feel like a Valeria game. Uh, there's enough there thematically um, and, and looks aesthetically like the use of Miko's artwork, that alone. The four main guilds, which are the same four guilds you're going to find in most Valeria games. Um, the similarity of icons and token shapes, like your magic is that little blue triangle. Your food's the weird, well, I don't know if it's an apple or a peach, but what are the two? I've seen that. That was in one of the small box Valeria games. Like it looks like a Valeria game. Like if I look at it, I'm like, yep, yeah, that's a Valeria game. And I'm glad to see the Valeria license branch out as it did with, say, Thrones of Valeria. But it just feels like this could be better tied to more of the other Valeria games. It is, however, better tied to the theme than some recent outings. And the more you make use of citizens certainly helps it feel that yeah. um, feel more Valerian, both with the artwork and the die manipulations and combos that those citizens bring to the game. I found this interesting. I got a bit of a folk on a map area majority feel when playing this, like a war game feel, right? It, it kind of felt like a war game. Um, a Castle in Zavaria kind of reminds me um, most specifically of the all-time classic area majority game, El Grande. The difference, though, is that in this particular thing, the things you're putting out on the map are buildings in general, or buildings, uh, boats, and, and citizens, and arches and temples, and not troops. So you're not putting forces out. You also don't get the movement you see in war games. You're not invading and taking over territories or anything like that. But you do get that ebb and flow as control between regions shifts between players each district and each round. It will be interesting to see what happens when the final player pieces are used. As the districts were reasonably visually crowded, mm -hmm. but not as physically crowded uh, as, as they can be when... You expect from the amount of building you're doing in each of these districts. I will say what I loved at the end of the game is just getting a picture of our completed city with everything in 3D standing up. And I thought that was actually a really cool look. And I'm like tempted to use that in an RPG setting somehow is here's our next city with its six districts. And look, there's a temple over here and there's a gate over there. Overall, I was really impressed by the prototype copy of Castlands of Valeria, the daily magic game sent to check us out. While it was a bit rough to learn, and the iconography can be overwhelming, 
It didn't take long for the people I played with to pick everything up, and then the game started to flow very well. It's a surprisingly quick game for its depth once you have players who know what they're doing. The component quality here is is awesome. Like, it, it is top-notch, uh, even with the tiny ones. Bigger will be a little better. The, the, the two-layer player board, the amount of wooden pieces all silk-screened on both sides, that's the kind of stuff you don't always see, and it's great to see. Now, while there were some issues with our prototype comp copy, like, again, things weren't quite the size they should have been, things didn't nestle very well, and there were some rulebook issues, I fully expect every single one of these to be fixed with the production copy. The one issue I don't know if they're fixing uh, in the final issue is the icons on the citizen cards. And while they all have references, as Valeria players would expect, every card has a reference uh, in, in one of the manuals, they aren't always as clear without checking mm. as the ones on the player board became, for instance. Uh, this can have the effect of reducing their use in the game, and they are intended to be an important part of play. Yeah, and Sean's calling that out because in games we played, we had someone ignore the citizens because they didn't want to bother looking up what they did. So that is a thing. And and I, I'm going to guess that iconography is not going to change, but the reference should be more readily available and easier to read than what we had to deal with. We right. didn't even find it because it was in what I thought was a lore book. Now, as things stand now with the prototype we played, I strongly recommend, I, I'd say most Euro gamers, most, most hobby game groups, check this out, um, whether on Kickstarter or once it funds and it's available in retail. I fully expect this to fund and deliver. Daily Magic has a great track record of successful Kickstarters that did deliver. This is a really solid area majority game, and it seems like the perfect medium weight game that a wide variety of groups will enjoy. It features a nice balance of perfect information and randomness that's going to really appeal to Euro fans will also love the strategic and tactical depth. You need to plan out your actions carefully and plan ahead, especially when you're drafting those dice and plan out your three moves for the turn, but also be able to adapt on the fly based on what the other players are doing. Now, if you love card kingdoms of Valeria, but haven't delved deeper into the Valeria world with other games, I think players should be aware that this is a step up in complexity. Yeah. Not a huge step, but one worth mentioning so that you make sure your group is ready to take that step up. Now, what you aren't going to find here, and I don't think there's any real confusion like based on the box art of anything with people making this mistake, is you're not going to find a thematic fantasy game. There's no feeling of adventure here, and except for the fact that you have a resource called Magic, this could be a historic game and not a fantasy one. It also really doesn't have a lot of Valeria feel, at least not to me. So it's getting really hard to say what is a Valeria feeling game anymore with the number of different ways they branched out. But to me, it just didn't, I, I don't know. There was something, I, there was no conflict that seemed to be missing in this. There was no fighting enemies or exploring kingdoms. It just, I, I felt it was missing a bit of that. But again, it just could be, I'm used to playing the older Valeria games as opposed to some of the newer ones. Yeah, while we haven't played it from my reading, I feel thematically this is going to be in a vein more like uh, Guild Academies of Valeria, which mm. still hasn't actually delivered yet. Um, but this has taken the world in a slightly different direction than Shadow Kingdoms and Card Kingdoms and even the recent Dice Kingdoms, which are that combat and into the more the, the more city life, non-combat yeah. based uh, side of the Valeria world. Now, personally, I, I think it's obvious. I can't wait to see how this, this Kickstarter campaign goes. I'm looking forward to it launching. Um, I'll be watching to see what the production improvements are. And I really want to see this new combined rule book and reference sheets and see how well that's presented. That's I have a vested interest in that one. If it's not done well, I've got an email contact. I may be like, hey, no, no, this still isn't good. Um, what I'm really curious about to see, though, is if they add anything to this since the, the the prototype copy. So, for example, we previewed the prototype copy of Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria. I had no idea Rise of Titans was going to be put in as a Kickstarter thing. So, uh, Daily Magic is known, not known for like a bunch of stretch goals, and the game keeps getting better and keeps getting better, gets getting better, but they tend to throw in some Kickstarter exclusives or something that'll be available for retail later that we haven't gotten to see, and I want to know what that is. Well, that's it for our preview of Castellans of Valeria, an area majority game set in the Valeria universe. Now, there sure are a lot of Valeria games out there now. What are your favorites? Let us know 
in the comments below. Now, for a somewhat more detailed overview of play and lots of pictures of our prototype copy, check out my Castellans of Valeria written review over on the blog. Listening to this on your podcatcher of choice? When the episode is done, why not leave us a review? The more reviews we have, the better chance our show will get noticed by someone new.